Hey everybody, so today I just wanted to share an accomplishment that someone who's been watching this channel for about two and a half years achieved, which is solving a motherboard repair that was not solvable by another business that's been in business for over almost 15 years, if not more. Not only was that business not able to solve it, but they kind of butchered it in the meantime, and Tim was able to fix the board entirely and recover the data, which is very important on this model machine since the solid state drive is soldered onto the motherboard. You destroy the board, there's a good chance you're not getting your data. Now, what makes this impressive is not that he was able to solve a board that somebody else wasn't, nor is it the fact that he was able to open his own retail store in the communist country of California, where I hear it's very expensive to do business. And everything causes cancer, including the politicians. So this is his store. He's got a nice little store over here. He's got some MacBooks on display. This is his workbench setup. It's nothing too crazy. Pretty simple setup. He's got five stars on Facebook. He's got five stars on Yelp. And he has a website here where he offers service to other businesses that want to send board repair and also end consumers that want to send in MacBooks that are broken to be fixed. None of those things on their own are impressive. What I find very impressive is that he didn't really know how to do much of this until he started watching the channel two and a half years ago at the age of, I believe, 15. So he was 15 when he started this, and at 18 years old, he is just kicking ass and taking names and making money off uh, fixing things that companies that have been in business for 15 years could not figure out. And I gotta be honest, there are times where I just kinda wonder, why am I putting this much effort into this? You know, why am I trying to create a guidebook on how to compete with my business uh, on the internet? Why am I putting not just effort into posting videos that know the show we know what we're doing, but also putting all this time into categorizing them on my uh, on my forums so that it makes it easier for people to learn because it'll all be categorized by model or by problem? Why do I put the effort into like at put uh, you know writing the guide that I wrote that's about 150 or 200 pages to get people started in basic electronics and uh, and board repair. Why do I put the time into editing out all these live streams and w when I probably could just post them as is? And it's days like this where I see people doing this that I realize it is worth it. You know, there are times in life where you may have certain experiences that just give you a little kick of dopamine or just make you feel happy that day for no reason. Maybe um, a, a woman who is a cheerleader who's pretty attractive and kind of nice comes into the store and admits that there, none of these devices actually belong to her. She's just taking her friend's broken stuff and bringing it so that she has an excuse to see you because she has a crush on you. Or maybe you log into your Ameritrade account that one day and you realize there's a company you had invested in that got FDA approval before they thought they would and your, the stock goes and your bank account goes up. But one of the best feelings on earth for me is watching someone who started out where you started with a similar family situation, maybe a similar difficult life situation, who was in your shoes, just blaze past you so fast as a result of information that you put out there. I started about 10 and a half years ago doing this. I had an internship at Avatar Studios. I wasn't really sure how to, I didn't really have great mentors in business, so I had to learn a lot of my own really expensive lessons that I've posted on here, and I've also had to learn board repair uh, a different way than you may be learning it, because back in 2011-12, like, the information just wasn't out there the same way. So I managed to get my store open like an actual retail facility not just some studio that I'm sharing in exchange for the services of making the gear and the rooms work I got my own store around the age of 24 or so I got better at board repair around 25 26 and the th yeah around 24 25 26 and Tim uh, got really good at board repair at the age of 16 and now at 18 has his own store in the Communist Republic of California, which I think, again, is incredibly, incredibly impressive. Not just that he's able to do these repairs that others can't, but that he was able to open a store and get really good feedback on it at the age of 18. You know, there's this feeling that comes when you see someone skip ahead of all the mistakes and all of the bullshit and all of the, the misery that you went through as a result of learning something. And when you get to see that someone skipped two to four to six years of painful, expensive, brain-draining, difficult lessons, it's cool. Just watching the next generation cut the line like that, it's so rewarding, and it, makes, and it makes all of the other stuff worth it. It makes all the effort that I put into this stuff worth it. Now, one of the reasons that I want to post this video is that there are a lot of people who've said that what I've done is dumb. Why are you showing everybody how to compete with you? Well, there's no way in hell I would ever do this within my own business and blah de blah de blah uh, But the thing is, is that when you get to see just how far ahead someone can cut in line from the next generation with just a little bit of help and a little bit of encouragement and a little bit of the right information, I want to try and inspire people in other fields to do the same outside of this field. What do you think the next generation could do so much faster and how much better could they do if 
you were able to just, you know, take away some of the roadblocks and uh, give them the information that you wish that you had rather than hoard it or save it for yourself. There is so much knowledge trapped inside of individuals' brains that they just don't make available. And a lot of that knowledge that you have is probably worth a lot more than the knowledge that I have. And if the little bit of knowledge that I'm able to share, this teeny tiny junk that is able to be stored in this, you know, 512 kilobyte of a brain that I have here, just imagine what you could do. Imagine what effect you could have on the world by sharing the things that you know openly and freely. It also makes me kind of happy that I did not choose to do YouTube as a business. I remember Eli, the computer guy, saying, you know, you should up to try and focus on YouTube as a business. Then when he uh, started not liking YouTube, he said you, you maybe want to focus on being a content creator as a business. And I see where he's coming from. I really do. But one of the problems with that is that if I were to have gone down that path of seeing YouTube as a business, a lot of the stuff that I've been creating that were able to help individuals like Tim achieve what you're going to see him achieve later in this video may have not been put up. So what do I mean by that? Well, if you take a look over here, let's take a look at an educational video that I did. So this is a really important concept of the sequence of power lines or the sequence of signals and why you need to learn this, why it's important. This video is talking about that and it has all of 4,100 views over the course of four years. This, is, th this would not buy me a can of cat food. If I'm talking about how the SMC modes matter and how being in an incorrect mode or some of the pull-ups by the SMC uh, being corroded could keep PM Sleep S4L from coming on, people who weren't aware of the, of the link between PM Sleep S4L, which is a common issue on MacBooks when that signal is missing, and the SMC, they may not be able to fix it. But this video teaches you what's going on there, and this has 9,000 views, which might just buy me a can of cat food. It wouldn't buy me the wellness core. It wouldn't buy me the Hill Science, Hill's prescription uh, urinary care that Mr. Clinton needs now that he's 10 years old. But it might just buy me some fancy feast. But then when you get over to videos where I say, uh, fuck Apple, this gets 250,000 views. If I do fuck Apple part two, 100,000 views is iMac trash, 440,000 views. I talk about um, Jessa Jones and the, her piece from CBC on data recovery and how Apple is lying to people about it, 440,000 views. You get the idea here. And hell, I mean, even if I just so much as upload a video of my cat, you people would rather see Mr. Clinton the cat meow and scream at me, or a cute little Blackberry, or an angry little Clinton like in this video. Even this! This gets five or ten times the viewership of me putting up information, uh, trying to teach and educate and help people. Now, I'm not putting those Apple videos up because I just see it, huh, if I talk about something that Apple did that bothers me, I will make some money. I already make money. I have a business. I have 11 employees. I, this, this, is, this is negligible. The, but I talk about the things that affect me. Delete that. I talk about things I notice within the industry that I work. Sometimes those are going to be things that uh, go into that F Apple narrative. And it's very obvious, it's com very obvious here that if I wanted to become rich off of YouTube, that the proper thing to do would be to stop posting up all these stupid videos on CD3215s and PM Sleep S4Ls and ISL 9239s and PP3v3 underscore G3Hot's relation to PP3v42 underscore G3Hot and to just post and pa pandering to an audience. Ra and the thing is, if I did YouTube full-time, I would have to think, do I really want to screw up the algorithm? Do I really want the algorithm to realize that, oh yeah, you have a much worse engagement ratio now that you're posting these educational videos. Maybe we should stop suggesting people to you. Maybe we should stop sending subscribers to you. If my rent were controlled by any of that, then if my uh, ability to feed myself or my family or my kitty cat or to live indoors were affected by how the algorithm saw my content, then I would have to actually care about these things rather than caring about what I want to care about, which is showing people how to do what I do and helping people that started out where I started out live a little bit of an easier life. So I'm actually quite happy that I have not decided to do content creation as a job, and I don't think I'm going to be doing that at any point into going into the future. I quite like uh, sticking, to my, um, sticking to my knitting, as my grandma would have said. That being said, I'm going to stop talking and taking up space now, and we're going to hand this off to Tim, who's going to show you how to repair a board that a company that's been in business over 15 years not only wasn't able to fix, but couldn't even solder a chip on with balls. For the people who are going to watch this, I hope you learned something, especially the person that destroyed this board. If you're watching this, shame on you. That being said, let's get to Tim's repair. 
Today we're going to be taking a look at an A1707 Touch Bar MacBook that has already been worked on by a large national company. Upon inspection, we could see some previous rework to one of the CD3215 USB-C controllers. Otherwise, it looks pretty clean. I can't see anything too obvious right here. It's kind of hard to tell if this has been ultrasonic. You can't really tell a lot of the times, but this may have been ultrasonically cleaned. So we're going to go ahead and measure DC in voltage as always first. So if we plug in the charger, measure at the DC in fuse, both sides we get 5 volts so there's something up with our CD3215 circuit um, or USB-C circuit I'm going to show you guys right now here's our multimeter here's our fuse and we get 5 volts so we're going to take this board out and see if we can't solve it the board is out of the enclosure now so we're going to go ahead and take a look and uh, see if we see anything obviously wrong with it we notice these are one um, two of our CD3215 see how these look the, the edges are not burned or anything there's no sign of rework around them and then we look at this side and we see that this has been heated and you see the other flux right here um, this someone may uh, think this is corrosion by it but this is not this is flux um, it's kind of it looks like kind of a nasty flux but yeah this is all flux um, and this chip is clearly clearly had rework by it so see this chiseling right here this can happen in two ways. So this happens if you get the chip really hot or if you're picking it up and gripping it and while you're heating it off the board. That's a definite possibility. So let's see and let's look and see if we can see the balls under it and how they look. You can see that they're a little bit, but not too great. We can't really tell what's happening under that chip. So in this case, we have two of them that have been reworked and we know we have five volts on, on DCN. So what we need to realize is, for one, we don't know what happened to this board. Since we're not the first ones that got it, we don't know what happened to it. We don't know if it had liquid damage, if it just stopped working. So the first thing we're going to check is PP3B3 G3 hot, which should show up around one of these USB-C controllers. So C3100 right there. So another thing to think about is if there's an issue with any CD3215 in the system, you will get 5 volts there. The CD3215s all need to communicate with each other and with the SMC to work. So an SMC issue is also possible. But without 3B3 G3 hot, which is very similar to what PP3B42 would do in the old boards, if that is not present, none of this will work. So plug it in and let's measure that. Now the most common cause of PP3V3 G3 hot to be missing on the newer USB-C boards is a bad ISL 9239. So we're going to plug this in. And that is 3.29 volts, so there's no issue there. If someone reballed these or replaced them, we have to think about why they replaced them. So were they corroded? Did it have 5 volts to begin with? And the second thing to think about is that if they reballed it, did they reball it good? Has it been reballed poorly and that's why it's not working or why is it not working? So, so we're just going to go around checking for shorts, checking the basics here. That one's good. No signs of shorts around here. And I'm almost thinking, um, wait a second here. Now, is this resistor directly connected to ground? Should that be directly connected to ground? Let's have a look at the board view. I think that's okay if it's like that. going to do a PDF search via Paul Daniel software if it works, which it's not working. So R3033 is a, the schematic says it's no stuff, which is strange because there's a resistor there. So the schematic is saying this is no stuff. And there's a resistor here with signs of previous rework. So if this, if someone put that there without it supposed to being there, it's going to basically create a short to ground. That, well, I'm sure it has a purpose to begin with, but that should not be on there. So let's see if they even put the right one. We're going to measure resistance. Should be 100K. And we should have 100K resistance across this resistor. And we have zero ohms resistance across that resistor. So we either have a short or this resistor is really not supposed to be here. You don't understand. I'm not supposed to be here. So 
So we're going to put some flux down, remove this resistor, maybe give the CD3215 a little bit of a reflow too, because that flux looks pretty nasty. Let's see if we still have a short right here, because I don't think we should. I still don't think we should. But if there's a short on one side, that would... And no more short. So that's good. I think we just said, I think I would really be surprised if this worked. But simple mistakes happen, especially if you're replacing everything around, around that area. We still have 5 volts. Now this is interesting. We have 3 volts on one side, and none on the other. So that resistor may be blown or maybe being pulled down, which may be 100% normal. So which one is that? That is going to be R3038, which is SMC, USB-C, INTL. So the SMC needs to talk to these. With a signal called SMC, INTL, that's going to be an initialization signal. So most likely that is that signal is going to be used for the USB-C controller to talk to the SMC to initialize the whole circuit to work. So we're going to go back over and we're going to measure this resistor because I kind of think that's blown. With 3.3 volts on one side and none on the other, that seems either it's being pulled down by this chip or that resistor is dead. That resistor was R3038. We're going to look up the spec on that resistor. And that's a 10K resistor. That shouldn't... I don't think that'll pull it down like that. Nope, 10K. That's normal. So at this point, we could have an issue with one of our CD3215s or all of them. Given the fact it looks like this, been reworked, I'm probably going to go ahead and pull these both off and put two new ones on. At least we could rule out those both as variables. Um, because it does look like these both were replaced. We need all these to work before that's going to go to 20 volts. So in this case, I guess I'll go ahead and replace these two CD3215s that were messed with prior, or take them off at least and have a look, starting with this one. So there's a good chance that someone screwed up the reball on it. Or uh, you don't know what they did, they could have just reballed a bad chip, so... And there's hardly any solder on those. There's like no balls. See what I mean? Look at that, no balls. I wonder. I wonder if I reball this old one if it'll just work. Because that does not look like enough solder on those. So just for fun, I'm going to reball these. Because you can see that there's hardly any solder on those. You guys have seen how when I take off SMCs, there's plenty on there. There really isn't much here. So what my guess is, is it was replaced and it wasn't reballed. It was just solder put on it and then tried to reball. I mean, if you're a tech, you've probably tried to do that before. At least I have when I was starting, is just put solder on both pads and hope it flows into place. But that's really not, not a way to do it. But now we have to wonder, was the CD3215 the original issue? Or was it just blamed as a CD3215 issue? So lined up, we're going to grab our smallest captain tape that we have. The thing is, we don't want the captain tape covering where our balls are going to go. And that's what's kind of tricky about it. When you have a stencil, these aren't bad to reball at all. We have some nice balls formed. Good to go to pull out. Giggity giggity. Giggity go. We'll let that cool for a second until the balls um, dry. Gonna go 430 at 30 liters per minute. I'm gonna start from far away. Now it's in place. Could turn it up a little bit more. More like max air. That is good. Go ahead and let it cool a little bit. I'm going to go ahead and do the other one too because uh, that's probably going to be the same. Same place, same chip, same thing. Okay, have the uh, board back in the enclosure. I'm going to go ahead and hit the power button. It's been plugged in for a little bit because these will not boot if the battery is dead. So power button. These will take a minute to post too. So I have to give it a minute. I'm just going to lean it like this. Fan is spinning. Up a logo. And uh, so the issue was CD3215s had signs of previous rework. There was a resistor placed where a no stuff resistor should go, which is basically no resistor. That's not basically. It is where no resistor should go. So we were basically connecting a signal to ground when we shouldn't have been. One of the CD3215s was not reballed properly. It really had no balls on it or not enough solder on it. And that was the main issue causing this not to work. So this is good to go. And uh, thank you for watching.